The thing about six by seven songs is that they're so moronic. I mean, the idea was to always try and make a song with a in the style of the Velvet Underground, with one drum beat and, a, and as few notes as possible. So, you know, if I, if we were going to do an acoustic version of European Me, it would sound like this. Really well placed. It was just an incredible band in almost every way. When I first saw them live, they were just incredible. I don't think they sounded like anyone else. I mean, I think they, they certainly had had connections with bands like Mercury Rev, and they had their roots in a scene that was around at the time. But uh, why we loved them was they seemed to be taking it further, explosive and emotional, in, in a way that I don't remember anyone else being at that time. It's kind of, it's powerful. It's kind of. It's noisy, but it's not. It's not heavy metal guitar. It's it, it's got you know that sort of that John Lecky thought process to the music. There's a bit of depth to it that makes you that, that lifts you as well as just makes you. you know, it's not just aggressive. It's it's nuanced. Remember back to the Eat Junk Become Junk video. This isn't going to get played on TV. Who's going to play this? And that kind of bled into that ethos that I thought about the band. That they're just doing their kind of their own thing. And we don't need any other outside influence. The foundation of the band with the keyboards and the guitar, uh, creating the drone, the bass kind of leading it, the powerful drums, and then Sam would be the kind of almost ethereal, uh, improvised. Um, cosmic stuff over the top, you know. I think what made us different about other bands, and I think it's probably to do with Chris because he's quite driven, it was like we will be rehearsed, we will rehearse every day. We we're going to do this, five, we we're going to rehearse five, six days a week, right? And we had this little room, little rehearsal room over the road from um, a little booth called the Albion. I don't know, I can't imagine what it would have sounded like. All original bands start off shit, and that's, and that's I think that's the problem with like, um, Maybe today, really, people think they've got to be good straight away, and the thing is, it everybody sucks bad when they start, you know, and they shouldn't be afraid of that. It was like we were trying to fill a gap, so so we were looking at our record collections at the things we liked, but the things that weren't there and we imagined to be there were was the music that we were trying to make to put in there. Six by Seven came along at a sort of weird time, you know, because I mean, all the big 90s bands were past their prime. You know, Oasis's albums were starting to tail off a bit. The Verve had split up, and Richard Ashcroft was sort of turned into like this middle of the road artist. And then the new British bands that were coming through was stuff that was sort of very beige, like Chewing Breaks and Travis were big. And the American stuff was stuff like Papa Roach, Limp Biscuit, Nickelback. And all of a sudden, you just had this band who was sort of like this really sober and slap in the face, that who couldn't believe that this had been allowed to happen. You know, they had this massive like antagonism about everything around them, and it was just like they were sort of came along and just, especially with the second album, which is so angry, they sort of came along and went, "Hang on, everything's gone really shit." But no one else was doing that. Because it is, it is a snapshot of pre, pre the Strokes, pre the White Stripes, post the great 90s. There was a, there was a few years from like 99 to 2001 where everything had got a little bit smug and a little bit like sort of living off past glories. And they were a band who just came along and just sort of, they sounded like they just wanted, I mean Chris already looked like it on stage as well, he just wanted to throw things. 
had this record on the LED and just went crazy for it. They were really into it and described it as one of the all-time great debut singles. If you've got some press in the NME, then you know you, you're gonna you, you're gonna set out gigs and stuff like that. You know you're gonna shift a few records. And it was only really a matter of time before we we did a deal. I thought personally it'd be better to go with an independent. So it would give us an opportunity to, to do exactly what we wanted. Really, overriding memory of them back at the beginning is, is the day we signed them. I remember asking them where their name came from. Uh, I remember Chris telling me it was something to do with carpentry. That six by seven was there. As a size of shape of wood. It is an exclusive for you. Yeah. Those were 6x7, actually from my mum. They always followed um, what was going on with um, astronomy. And, uh, and my mum did too, and she just said, oh, you know, Gerd, the universe is expanding at a rate of 6x7. And I was like, let's write that down. Uh, and I didn't tell the guys that, and I hadn't told anybody that until just now. <laughs> The first album always captures a certain true, raw identity of a band, and I think the second album is normally a better record, but no one kind of takes as much notice of it, and sometimes the second album can sort of sneak under the radar a bit. Six by seven. You know, when you do your first album, you have, you have three or four years to write that. The record comes out and promote it by supporting other bands and doing your own shows and things like that. And then when that comes to an end, uh, it's a case of, well, we need to make the next record. And you've got like six months to make your second one. You know, in our case, I think it was about six weeks. But, but having said that, you don't need it because you've already gone through and you're at the other side. We decided to do the record in the studio in, uh, in Nottingham. Went into the Square Centre, into our hometown, and we battened down the hatches and we just did what we wanted to do. We could have stayed there all night, every night, you know, we could have, you know, it's the place where we all wanted to be was in that room doing the record. If someone had walked in there and gone, that sounds great, moves the chorus, we'd have probably killed them. It allowed us just to kind of indulge ourselves, which you can't imagine that ever happening these days, where it's like, right, well, here's a load of money, okay, if you're an established massive act, but, you know, like a, uh, an act, uh, a band who, who spent a lot of money on the first album, not recouped that yet, and they were like, yeah, yeah, come on, just go on your way. And, and you, how many songs have you got? Oh, you've got no songs. That doesn't matter. Just go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, fucking what? We ended up just here. We had the drums here, bass there, and uh, I was here. And Sam's guitar over there, James was over there. And then we just basically played live. There was a few overdubs, but not many. I mean, it was very um, kind of live, live recording. And uh, I mean, together we kind of moulded the sound, really. The reason why I like The Close You Get is because it was the album that we made purely for ourselves. There was no second guessing something or referencing something that was around at the time or any other music particularly and um, we were just going with whatever came out of us on the spur of the moment. It doesn't exist in a time other than in that room that, that month. It's all empty now, nobody here anymore. Sonically, it just it was sort of like this avalanche of sound and builds and builds and then breaks. If you listen to the album, it's, it's like this, it's, it's this like whirlwind that goes through and think, oh, what, are we, what, are we, what are we like? So it was a case of writing songs that were three and a half minute pop tunes and then also seven and a half minute kind of prog. And I don't think that helped the cause of the band really because it's probably a good idea to do one or the other. Journalists loved them, they got great reviews, but he just wasn't interested in that. If you look back at their interviews, especially there's like a MTV one, <laughs> it's almost like he's just, he's so begrudging that he has to speak. 
Like every word comes out with like a little bit of spite. Didn't think we got that many bad reviews. That's probably probably why we didn't sell too many records. <laughs> it's like uh, it's that thing, isn't it? With like that Led Zeppelin stuff like that. The press just blankly thought they were like shit. Blanket reviews sold millions. Like Stereophonics never got a good review in there ever. Sold shitloads of records. Press Darlings six by seven. Five star reviews. Kind of didn't translate so much in the record sales. We always felt that America was a place where they could really succeed. There was a, a groundswell of great reviews and stuff coming over from the UK and it so felt on the verge of just something going to pop. In fact it didn't it didn't actually blow up as we hoped it would, but I think that was that was probably the moment when it when it might have and should have. Sadly it just didn't quite and I don't know why, because it should have done and they deserved it, but it really felt that ex the excitement was really there for them. Well six by seven was singing songs about sort of shitty streets in like urban sprawls and stuff like shopping centres and everything's crap and I don't think it, there just there wasn't an appetite for that at the time. And times were changing, the music industry, the internet was now coming in and really it wasn't going to go away and a lot, you know some factions of the industry were fighting it. I don't think anyone knew, knew how to use the internet um, for music other than to download it. I, I went into select this and I was finding six by seven albums in there for a pound. As much as it was a perfect storm for them coming together on that album creatively, they were just the wrong band in the wrong time. It must be very difficult to be in that position where it's everybody's sort of telling you it's going to go, it's going to go, it's going to go and then it doesn't quite go to the expectations what everybody's telling you. It must be very difficult on your psyche and your mental health and everything. We kind of felt that that doesn't make us a worse band. Well, that doesn't make us a bad band just because we didn't cross this line of, you know, 250,000 sales or whatever. To forest fields, this town, a safe place for me. And that's what I did, I, I worked with it because it was there and it was a window and it was an opportunity for, for someone starting out. Um, but the irony was that for the established labels it was a, you know, a pirate and it was, it was you know, something to be, to be fought. Chris is continually creative, you know, every day. You know, he's, he's an artist, he creates every day, that's what he, he kind of lives for. So I formed this thing called The Music Club, which then puts out, puts out the music, which is personal, personalised. Then there's the downloads thing through Bandcamp. Then there's putting out records and CDs through um, the distribution company. And then there's Kickstarter. And then you put all that together and I've carved myself out a job. He kept the dream alive and he's, he's through the, the leanest years. He kept the mail orders going and he kept in touch with his fans and he kept sending them newsletters and making new music and cottage industry. But now it's paying off. I can only say that, you know, those fans that have done that, they're, they're not fans to me, they're, they're almost like family. I can't really thank them enough and some of them are in Canada, Belgium, Germany, spread across England, yet we've all found each other. Well it's crazy really, we have a, a day on Six Music every year called Wear Your Old Band T-Shirts at Work Day and the idea is simple, the audience go to work in their old band T-Shirts, they send us pictures and then we play the records. 
And I thought, oh, I, should, I really want to play 6x7. 6x7 on breakfast radio would be fantastic. So I went to the website and bought a brand new 6x7 t-shirt. I thought, right, I'll wear that. So we played the track before the end of the programme. And that was it, the top and bottom of it. We just, you know, flung down the headphones, um, headed into the anteroom, into the oxygen tank, as per usual. Naked uh, massage in a Hungarian sauna and went home. Didn't think anything else of it. Until we, we, we heard this story much, much later that it had had some knock-on effect. And it just started to roll from there, really. And I kept logging in every other day or so and just seeing more and more people getting on board with it. It's a little bit like a... A spark in a in a in a sort of in a in a dry forest, isn't it? You know, and the spark becomes a flame, becomes a forest fire. It sounds amazing to me that we we're kind of partially responsible for a, a bit of a renaissance. But when you're playing an artist that you've loved and that doesn't really get played anywhere on UK radio, and you're thinking, well, we're going to play this on breakfast. This is going to sound incredible. And then you see a reaction from people who say, I love that band. I haven't heard that band in years. And then from that this thing then starts happening, the growing. This campaign started, this Facebook campaign started to get, get it to number one, and I kind of like, yeah, didn't take it too seriously, to be honest. Um, but then when I saw that, you know, the momentum it got, it was like, there's life left in this, perhaps, you know? And I think the fact that they still get played on Six Music, and that people still wear the t-shirts, and people still talk about them, it gives you such a good feeling to be able to release music that's already been released but hopefully to a brand new audience. And then now we've got these gigs as well and, and, and one of them sold out. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, there is a few people out there who still <laughs> who want this. And anyway, aren't we a, aren't we a heritage indie band now? <laughs> Isn't that what you do? You know, get re-release the your, your, your classic and, and get and go out and play it. And those songs sound sort of as vicious and intense as, as ever. So it won't be, I don't, it won't, I don't think it will have the feel of the sort of old guys around a campfire reminiscing about the old days. It'll be as vicious and as full as they always were. I think when the time's right, it's kind of what it's all about. In that uh, their, their, their cycles and their peaks and troughs, and now it just feels the right time for people to appreciate or reappreciate what an incredible band they were at all. I could see where they didn't quite fit in and I could also see where as the years have gone on other people have, have used their sound um, but not been as in, intense with it. They were a sort of band who just cast like a great light on what was going on around them um, and I'm really thrilled for them that now they have the opportunity that new people can discover it. There is just a sort of catalogue of some of the best music of like the early millennium there. And sort of one of basically one of for me one of the great undiscovered fans that of the UK has ever produced. after that sound in your head because it will pay off when all this is over and you're dead and gone the only thing that's left is the, the things that you created and if you diluted it because of what someone else wanted then you've left nothing behind <laughs>